You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. We are grateful to be here with you for another weekly drone news. In this week's intelligence briefing, we have a lot coming to the drone world as protests are now taking to the skies. But in addition, there is one new drone that has finally hit the market in a way that we can talk about. And also, drones for good? Well, they're truly, truly taking flight. And we're, Haya is going to be telling us all about that today in this weekly intelligence briefing coming to you from the skies. All right, my friend, the Flying Dutchman, how are you? Hey, good morning, Paul. How's it going? Doing well, sir. How are you? Very good. Very good. Thank you. I like that new name, intelligence briefing. I think uh, it has a little bit more it to it. <laughs> it does. It does. I, yeah. I, I agree. And I think with the level of detail that you provide, I think it's uh, well-deserved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, <laughs> well, enough of the ego stroking as we move on to this week's news. Haya, I have to say there is a lot going on. And in the wake of what's going on, it's really making people question on pretty much every foundational level. Who am I supporting when I buy things? What am I supporting and what does it mean? Which is leading people to really question some innate basic, well, actions that they're taking. And in the wake of the FAA conference causing extreme anxiety and controversy within the drone community, with even some people asking, is it even worth it anymore? Well, DJI once again sets the standard on professionalism, in my opinion, on how to handle these conferences, as they have now announced that Airworks is going on. And I have to say, I was very happy, Haya, to hear from our good friend Michael, as I thought that maybe he was no longer with DJI. So happy to hear that he still is. Great human being. But that being said, Haya, what's going on here? The Airworks conference, I hear is rather reasonably priced. Is that right? Yeah, that's very much uh, right. I mean, uh, DJI Airworks this year, it's going to be its fifth uh, time that they're holding this event. And for DJI, it's the biggest conference that they organize, the only one here in the United States, well worth going to or at least following. This year, it's going to take place from August 25th to 28th. And normally, that would last year, for instance, it was in a hotel in uh, downtown L.A., This year, of course, uh, with the coronavirus, they decided to make it a virtual event. So it's still going to happen on those days, all online. The the great thing is that it's only $35 if you take advantage of the flash sale that they're going to start on June 8th. So for $35, you get access to all the online seminars, presentations, and all the news from DJI during this Airwork uh, convention, which is, is awesome. I think for $35, that's a really good price. The early bird price, if you're a little later, is $45, and if you just wait until whenever you're ready, then you would pay the regular fee of $99. Compare this to the FEA UAS Symposium, which is priced as $375. Yeah, it kind of makes you scratch your head and and wonder what the heck is going on. Both the FEA UAS Symposium and DJI Airworks are two of the biggest events, uh, I think, in the drone world this year. And another interesting bit of news, the CES uh, 2021 event is still scheduled as a physical event. So they're still planning to have that event in Las Vegas and have people actually be able to go there. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens on that front. Of course, that's still what, like seven months out. So a lot of things might happen between now and then. But for now, it's still plans to go ahead. So uh, a lot of interesting news going on there. Definitely. I would say hi on a personal note. You and I left CES 2020 unscathed in a wake of uh, Chinese transmission of uh, the virus and lots of travel going on at that time. And now that we're learning that the virus may have been uh, going around much earlier than previously thought, I think you and I are very lucky. 
That being said, grateful for that. Grateful that DJI Airworks is a reasonable price so that they can cater to drone pilots. Drone pilots, in my opinion, Haya, it's kind of been 50-50 in the wake of the virus. Either you're still working construction and you're mapping stuff and business hasn't really like stopped, you know, you're still doing okay. But then for everyone on the creative side, it just seems like business has been completely squashed on pretty much all levels. So depending on where a particular drone pilot falls will be dependent on their financial repercussions. That being said, DJI, thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for doing this. I hope that other people in the industry like the FAA take note of this because $375 to attend a conference uh, like the FAA symposium, I would argue, Haya, is not only, well, unreasonable, but outright egregious. And I think that, you know, after speaking with some good friends in some not so high places at the FAA, It seems like the FAA is married to having to work with some private contractor to throw these conferences because of past instances of poor behavior. Uh. That's what I've been told. So if that is the case and AUVSI is really the only people that they can work with, I think it might be time for drone pilots to just outright boycott this because I'm not sure that there is a downside right now. Here's why, right? If drone pilots say, okay, no FAA symposium, and the FAA symposium has such lackluster numbers that no one is even there, it could force a reconsideration of which entity the FAA works with to throw a conference. Now, just to be really clear, I don't want to be working on throwing conferences, okay? So (laughs) I'm not (laughs) sure how many people do. So let's give AUVSI the benefit of the doubt, right? But AUVSI, respectfully, we are pushing you, and we are saying like remote ID and network remote ID, Uh, non-compliance, we're just going to have to, you know, respectfully respond with non-compliance and just say, you know what, you do not represent our interests. And uh, I think it's time that we we just say, you know, we're going to wash our hands of you and we're going to force the FAA to have to work with someone else because the FAA is saying we need desperately to hear from drone service providers, right? We need to hear, we need to hear, we need to hear. But year after year, there is a pattern, Haya, where $800, $1,000 to attend this conference. And the only real value, in my opinion, is the, the, the backroom chats, the fireside chats, the going to lunch with some of the regulators and saying, hey, why are you guys really doing this? Help me understand. Yeah. You know, all of that goes away. And so I just really question, and I'm not going to make a decision for drone pilots, and nor do I want to purport one. But what I do want to do is drone pilots, it may be time to ask yourself a very powerful question. Do I want to support a broken system? Right? We are already seeing protests, fundamentally questioned systemic issues that have been ignored for years. And let's take this and this, this, this ideology of, hey, who are we really supporting and what are we really doing? And by staying silent, are we actually helping or hurting the situation? I think right now, Haya, drone pilots have to kind of think with the same mentality and say, look, if we are really going to better the skies, if we are really going to work together, then FAA, AUVSI, it's time to prove in your actions that you actually want to do that because after three years of sub thousand dollar price points and i mean like hi i could not afford that as a drone pilot seriously why would i why like why would i want to go the only reason that you go is because you are a beltway bandit who's trying to lobby the faa to push them to do something and meanwhile the faa is like we can't figure out remote id let's hire industry insiders do you really think that you're going to get objective decision making when you're putting that type of pressure on companies and clients and we have this large bifurcation in the industry no no more okay done you know what's interesting dji of course a uh, for-profit business right i mean they sell drones to make money in the end i mean they they are passionate about drones i'm sure but they're a for-profit business AUVSI is listed as a non-profit international organization, so they're not supposed to be profiting from this. Meanwhile, their symposium is 10 times more than 10 times more expensive than DJI Airworks. 
So what's up with that, right? No, to further your point even more, SUAS News recently put out a piece going over the financial status of AUVSI. And while some of the tax returns were kind of old, in all honesty, it looks like the president of AUVSI gets paid more than senators, more than congressmen, more than uh, most CEOs that I know. And no offense, but the president of an association like that, I'm sorry, but you didn't work harder than most entrepreneurs to, or congressmen to get to that point. You, in my personal opinion, do not deserve that as a nonprofit organization. But Haya, everyone who's a businessman in America knows it. And if you don't know it, I'm going to say it now. I'm, I'm breaking open the secret door. Everyone knows in America, if you open up a nonprofit and you profit, all you do is you take the profits and you pay it as salary to everyone who yeah. started the association. And it's just a reclassification of income and they still get the money. So I love the fact that SUAS News, um, what, he... I'm glad, I'm happy that Patrick, you know, used his fire and his passion to like actually help us prove a point. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Which is, uh, you know, a lot of people are, you know, have their own opinions about Mr. Egan. But I think this is something that we can all be grateful for because it showcases just an egregious, egregious usage of funding. And it also shows that, look, if this tax return was from 2011, this was way before mm. drones were even on the radar which, you know what that right. means? It goes to show that AUVSI is really representing military and government entities. Yep. They sh It'd be nice if they lowered the price. I mean, uh, this goes back to what we were talking about last time. If the FEA really wanted to reach out to people and educate uh, recreational commercial drone pilots, they would make their symposium a lot less expensive. And I'm pretty sure if you take something online, you make it a webinar, then your whole cost structure is different and you can make things a lot, lot cheaper. And I don't know if uh, DJI did this on purpose, but if they can do Airworks online for 35 bucks a pop, then I don't understand why uh, AUVSI and the FEA would not be able to lower the price of admission for their symposium online as well. So something's got to change there for sure. Well, it seems like a phenomenal opportunity for AUVSI and FAA to come out and say, OK, enough with the talk. Yeah. We're, we are going to show you an action that we really do care. We do really want to open up the airwaves of communication. We're going to make this 25 bucks. Okay. I just want to be clear, though, to everyone, I'm still not going to go because it's my birthday. So, GFY. Grateful for you. <laughs> so, anyway, Haya, that brings us to our next piece of news, uh. which, frankly, I got to say, I'm getting a little uneasy, my friend, because even in Albuquerque, the looting and the rioting and the civil unrest. You know, a lot of people say this mm -hmm. is because of George Floyd. And I would I would argue that George Floyd was just a catalyst that uh, built yeah. upon other catalysts to showcase real systemic problems and to showcase that we have really ignored it and we have not really handled situations. And I agree with those people. I do not agree with the looting, right? I, I want systemic change in this country. I think it's a phenomenal opportunity to show and to prove people that life is first, that equality is equality, right? It's not because of any other reason other than the fact that they have a beating heart just like you. And when you put yourself in their shoes, you might just fundamentally understand how much of a battle that certain ethnic groups have to go through for the most basic shit. And frankly, it's it's unnerving. It's really unnerving. And you know, Haya, from last year, after one of our trainings, we had a really, really, really rough time with one of our producers because someone in my family did something that I was so embarrassed by, I had to call it out. And uh, it was embarrassing. And I had to have a really hard conversation with Hoel, our producer. And it caused some conversation that, um, I mean, like deep, hard conversation. But it helped me really realize just how some of these issues permeate way deeper than we had ever realized. And I hope more people have that conversation because it, it, it's humbling. But it's also a phenomenal opportunity to show to react with action and to lead by example. But I know that this is hurting the drone industry a lot, Haya. What's going on here? Uh, yeah, there's a couple of things going on. I mean, I think I think you're right when you say that uh, 
George Floyd's death was the final straw and you, and you see the unrest and the uproar among people are taking place in, in many different cities and even in different countries. I mean, this is not even a US issue anymore. I mean, I've read news articles about similar protests taking place in the UK, uh, in Canada now. So it's almost, I don't know if it's a global thing, but it, it definitely affects more countries than just the United States. And I agree with you that it's time for change and time for restructuring uh, how certain agencies work and operate. One downside of these protests, of course, is that, uh, as in many cases, some people take advantage of these situations and they start looting. And there's a couple of stories uh, that we have for our news show today where you see that that dark side basically um, taking place. One of them is the DJI store on Times Square in Manhattan that got looted. There's a video from the security cameras where you see, I think it's in total five guys. They're breaking in through the door and basically smashing the glass door, coming in and taking all the drones out of the uh, showroom. Now, a lot of these drones are uh, display models, so they're not actually functioning drones. Also, if they were drones that you could actually fly, I'm pretty sure DJI would know when you activate those drones. So I don't think it was a very smart move. You want to chip in there? I do, yes, uh, because as you know, we're very close with DJI New York City, and they're one of our great friends. And Sam, I'm so sorry that this happened to you. David, I'm so sorry that this happened to you. Um, but literally, you two are the smartest guys that I know. Every single one of those drones did not have a flight controller, ESCs, yep wiring and you know those little mavics that they took and the inspire are th yeah they're they're fake they're yeah. literally just a shell yeah. and same thing with the headset you see them grab the headset yeah. and i was talking to one of my friends and i was like why would they grab a headset that doesn't even work with any of the new drones these guys were clueless they just they just had dollar signs in their eyes they see expensive drones they smash the door they steal the stuff and had they known they would know that they they're stealing models that that wouldn't actually fly and also the real stuff uh, would probably be in the back or in the basement of that building where they keep all their inventory but what i heard is they actually removed all the inventory because they knew there was a good chance that uh, like many other stores their store might be broken into as well so sam and the other guys running that store for sure were smart and, and well prepared so kudos to them Seriously, kudos to them. But I know yeah. that brings you to another news story, which, well, uh, other people are having damage to their buildings as well. Yeah, this takes us to uh, AirMap. AirMap, one of the uh, cohort partners for the FEA for remote ID for drones. Their office is in Santa Monica, California, and this was about a week ago. A couple of buildings were set on fire, and I don't know exactly where uh, AirMap is located, but I think they might actually be on top of a retail location. So the buildings burned down, and I don't know if you've seen some of the photos, but AirMap's office is, uh, is basically destroyed. We first found out from a tweet from Greg McNeil, who's one of the uh, co-founders of AirMap, and his images were just devastating. I mean, if you just picture a totally burnt out building, that's what their office looks like. I mean, desks, computers, everything is gone. It's burned to the ground. So, yeah, I don't know um, how quickly they'll be able to recover. He did mention in his tweet, though, that all his employees were already working from home. So I would imagine that um, there were, nobody was injured, nobody got hurt. So that's, that's a very good thing, of course. But I would imagine that a lot of the information uh, that they uh, have was either stored online or on those laptops uh, that people took with them to work from home. So hopefully they'll be able to recover quickly. I mean, of course, we, we don't wish this upon anybody in the drone industry. And it's very unfortunate to see uh, what happened to their office building. I agree. It's unfortunate that we are all small business owners, right? And right now, um, big business is being um, prioritized over everyone else, which is really, really, really unfortunate. But also, again, we are all small business owners. So, Greg, from me to you, I'm really sorry that this happened to you. I really am. But uh, drone pilots might actually be rejoicing and grateful as this could actually slow down the negative regulatory strategy that AirMap has been pushing since 2013. When they first started with noflyzone.org, when they tried to get people to register their homes to create no-fly zones, which is completely against federal law, and then they continued to lobby Congress and the FAA to segregate the airspace so that every drone pilot, hobbyist, STEM education, the old guys at the AMA field, and you and myself, Haya, would have to pay to access said airspace. In fact, we were the ones who leaked all the documents showcasing that they were spending astronomical amounts of money to really put the industry down. And to now see that AirMap 
is a USS provider for network remote ID, this is reason number 687 why I will not comply with network-based remote ID. It's that simple. Now, I think that there is a very, very, very common, um, clear consensus on what a remote ID could look like that would provide the government with exactly what they're looking for. Where is the pilot? Right? So if we had a broadcast standard, meaning all the drones that we already have that work right now could broadcast, and then imagine a simple Lance system, but instead of Lance just in controlled airspace, imagine it everywhere. And all you would have to do is, hey, I'm flying here um, for the next uh, six hours and at a half mile radius. And there you go. Yeah. And here I am. And now you're not yeah. going to give that information to the public because that's illegal. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so here's the thing. I want to shore this up. It sucks for anyone when you get your business burned down. I'm sure insurance wise, Greg has more insurance than probably the average person. And I'm sure that they're going to be fine. But this also doesn't make it okay to start supporting the people that are hurting us in the industry. So I just want to say that. Like, yes, it sucks. Yes, we're sorry. We don't want this to happen to anyone. It doesn't matter who you are. But in all honesty, I'm personally uh, grateful that maybe this slows you down in your negative effects on the industry as a whole. And that is for me, Paul. I would argue that this is probably not company policy. Company policy would be from DroneU to AirMap, we're sorry deeply sorry that your business was hurt in the wake of looting and protests. Looting is not good for any business, especially small business owners. And it sucks. There you go. You said it. Next one, flying drones in Washington, DC. Oh man, <laughs> I am interested about this Haya because yeah. you know, again, we're seeing more and more drones and protesting from, you know, in your in your next story about L.A. and then this story. And did you see us tweet the fact that we saw that helicopter hovering over protesters in D.C.? They Our tweet got taken down. Got uh, taken down? Yeah. Wow. And now there's Any an... Tweet, now, they specify why or... No. Uh, and now there's an active investigation on said incident. So I wonder if there was any correlation there. But Haya, I'm personally really excited as someone who grew up in D.C. What's going on over there? Yeah, in D.C. you're not allowed to fly drones. Uh, of course, you have the airport that's uh, very close to the, to the city center as well. But you're not allowed to fly drones anywhere in uh, Washington, D.C. So it was very interesting when we saw a tweet and a video clip and a photo from Jim Acosta. He's a White House correspondent. I'm sure most people will have heard of his name. That showed a drone flying over the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, which is really close to the White House. And the video was shot probably with a smartphone, so you can't really zoom in and kind of see what kind of drone it is. But it sure looked like a Matrice from DJI, which would make it even more interesting because that, of course, is a drone made by a Chinese company. And we know how much pushback there's been recently from many different government bodies that we should no longer be using uh, Chinese made drones or drones that contain Chinese made parts. So we can't confirm that it was a DJI Matrice. Uh, if you look at the photo and the video footage, uh, it sure looks like one flying right downtown in Washington, D.C. Apparently, this was a Secret Service drone that was basically just monitoring the situation, giving an aerial perspective of all the protests that were taking place. And we've seen drones being used in that fashion quite a bit recently. But yeah, for sure, this was an, uh, this was an interesting one. I love the fact that these erroneous security claims, which are so easily stopped with not allowing Internet to the drone. Come on, you dummies up at our administration. But you know what? I'm grateful for you because you're showing that even though you're like, no Chinese drones, they're the worst, they're bad. Yeah, but you're using them because you see how valuable they are. So thank you for showing yeah, the world what convenient. you truly believe. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pretty convenient. Uh, if you need a set of eyes in the sky, that you can just grab the Matrice and fire it right up. <laughs> grab the so. best drone we have. Get the Matrices. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'm I'm seriously grateful for that because it showcases that they're the best drones. And yeah, I agree that we need an American manufacturer, but we need to allow for an American manufacturer to scale up, and that just doesn't exist. I saw an article from Forbes just yesterday saying that Skydio paid thirty grand to a lobbying firm to get public safety to buy their drones. And I thought, I was like, that's really interesting. It seems like even though that article was published this week, it seems like it's six-month-old information because seeing Fritz Reber go on LinkedIn and talk about commenting, you know, I've said our drones are for public safety, but, you know, you can't fly at night, you can't do this, you can't do that, and I want to be honest with people. And I, and I thought about that and I was just like, huh, I, I wonder how relevant it, this information is because we know Skydio is having a lot of problems fulfilling orders. And um, it's really interesting. Someone mentioned uh, a news shot and they were like, look at the parts and components in the background. And I, I haven't – I'm just saying that because someone mentioned it to me. There's just nothing – uh, that I can see there. But while I would love to see Skydio produce a drone that's a phantom killer or or equivalent of a phantom, I just don't think they're there yet. And I don't think that they understand what the market wants. That being said, I hope that they get there and I would love to help them. But I just really oh. wonder, Haya, is it really even feasible? I don't know. I mean, don't don't forget that the uh, obstacle avoidance system from the Skydio 2 uh, needs daylight in order to operate. And of course, a lot of times when you need a drone, when when you need to save somebody's life or there's a police force or department that needs to fly a drone, a lot of times that happens when it is dark or it's about to get dark. So in that sense, the Skydio 2 might not be the ideal drone in all situations anyway. Yeah, I agree. In fact, I you know I did that video on the Skydio, and I really had a lot of fun, and I still have a scar because of it. But I will say that I've kind of realized, practically speaking, I really don't fly that drone at all. Like, I gave the drone to Rob. Rob's been taking it up to Colorado every weekend, getting some really cool stuff. But when they prioritize the VIO over pilot input, that's a serious problem. That's a really serious problem. In my opinion, it makes all kind of it makes it an entirely different drone, right? I mean, it's more a self-flying GoPro camera that can record you while you do your thing, and you don't have to worry as much about is the drone going to fly into something or crash into something. And I think in that, if you look at the drone in that regard, then yeah, it's a great drone. If you look at the drone more like, hey, I'm a creative photographer, um, videographer, and I need a tool in the sky to get this cinematic footage and I want to be in control of what the drone does, then I don't think the Skydio is the drone to use. Uh, Apart from the fact that the camera might not be suitable for those uh, use cases anyway, but just the way you fly it, it's it's not, it it doesn't put the pilot in control. It's the drone who, uh, who makes a lot of the decisions for you. And that causes a lot of safety concerns, but moving on, I know you have a lot more to talk about when in in regards to protesting. And I know that drones are being used more and more in protests, which frankly is unnerving for me, Haya, because when people start making decisions egregiously on emotion, this is when problems are going to occur. And frankly, I don't see it as a good thing for the drone industry as we are trying to promote responsible usage of drones, yeah. which is why I wrote the article on Drone You about how to legally fly a protest to try to help everyone who does want to fly a protest, whether you're trying to document the protest, help a small business owner with verification of alarms, or if you're trying to do persistent surveillance for a small business owner, right? There are many ways you can use drones on both sides of the protest. Uh, or the many, mm-hmm. the many sides of the protest. But that being said, Haya, I am concerned with some of the posts that we're seeing, especially from some quote-unquote, I would not call this person a, a drone uh, industry insider, but other people would. But let's talk about this really scary footage that you are showing us that's going on from L.A. County. This takes us from uh, Washington DC all the way to the West Coast to uh, Los Angeles. There's been a video clip uh, that was shared on social media, Facebook, 
where you see an LAPD helicopter flying when it's dark uh, in the evening and you see a phantom drone. And the video says that the uh, helicopter is trying to um, wipe out the drone base there or use the prop wash to just get it out of the air. It's hard to say because obviously the, the video is shot from quite a distance, so it makes it hard to judge what the distance is between the helicopter and the drone. Secondly, it's dark already and the drone moves quite a bit all over the place. So it's hard to know exactly what's going on. It was filmed during protests in Los Angeles. And of course, a lot of these protests kind of turn to the dark side when it actually gets dark. Uh, it happens after curfew, later at night. And when you fly a drone, of course, you have to take into account, uh, talking about uh, using a drone to document protest, that you can't fly or you're not allowed legally to fly when it's dark. You're not allowed to fly over people. You should be keeping your drone within line of sight. So there's a lot of things that you should take into consideration when you want to document these protests or the things that happen after the peaceful protests, the looting and stuff, with a drone. Now, we don't quite know what the actual story here is. I mean, they say that the video shows the LAPD helicopter trying to push the drone down and get it out of the sky. Based on the footage, it's hard to determine if that actually is the case or whether these are just two aircraft that happen to be very close to each other at the same time. However, the video does paint a dangerous picture, right? Because you have a manned aircraft, you have people on the ground, and you have a drone flying there. So it does create this image of something going wrong or potentially going wrong and a drone being involved. And that's not a good thing. I know uh, you guys from the drone, you promote, of course, responsible and safe drone flying. At Drone Excel, we do the same thing. We want to make sure that people are safe, that they know how to fly their drones, and they do so in a responsible and a safe manner. So that's basically my reason for still wanting to share this article on Drone Excel and also here on the show, not so much because of the story itself, but more to point out that, hey, if you want to use a drone to document these protests, then do so in a safe and responsible way and make sure that you uh, you fly your drone accordingly. I couldn't agree with you more, Hi. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think one thing that will help people too is make sure you're not flying in a TFR. And if you do fly protests, try to fly over rooftops to make it easily provable that you were not flying over people. Because yeah. I think it's so critical. By the way, I also linked on that article the FAA's instructions to police on how to handle drone incidents. And that's something that I carry with me everywhere, thanks to PJ. PJ was actually the person who gave me the insight to that. Now, that being said, I know that Ryan was saying that uh, this police helicopter was trying to push the drone out of the sky. That's a pretty serious, um, pretty serious... Stay yeah, statement charge. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And frankly, this goes to show that this guy really isn't an aviation uh, uh, person either. Because if you really watch the video, there's two things to be aware of, right? Thing number one, if you notice when the drone drops down because of the prop wash from the helicopter, do you notice, number one, the rate in which it drops down, and then number two, the rate in which it stops? Because both of those would showcase to you two things. Number mm -hmm. one, the prop wash is extremely powerful. And number two, it stopped really fast. Why? Because it looks like the helicopter was transversing, transversing the drone, yeah. not hovering the drone. Haya, you and I know from one of the trainings that we did at the NTSB Training Academy, we can drop a Phantom or a Mavic out of the sky with the prop wash from an Inspire 2. Like, it's not hard at all. It's called Vortex Ring State. And essentially, when we, th when we throw a cylinder of air over our aircraft, what happens is that the aircraft is just pushing this air through its propellers, and it's essentially stuck in this cylinder, which if you've attended a flight mastery class, you know how to get out of that. But for most people, this freaks them out. That being said, if we also look, just like you said, about the camera angle from the news helicopter, we don't know how much zoom there is, and we don't really know the true position of the drone in relation to the helicopter due to the vast mm -hmm. amount of distortion. So let's put our investigator caps on and really look at this video and not just jump to conclusions. I've seen a lot of conclusions out there, and it really saddens me because it gets me back to kind of the first point we made in the news show, that we're in this age where we have to start thinking about what we're supporting and, and what we're really doing, right? Yeah. No, I mean, I don't know exactly what kind of cameras and lenses they use in these news helicopters, but I mean, they have to keep a safe distance, especially when there's a police helicopter involved, right? So that news helicopter must have been flying at quite some distance from this actual event taking place. If they use a very strong zoom lens, you get a lot of compression. So it makes it really hard to say, okay, the helicopter's here, the buildings are this far away, the drone is this far in between, the trees are over here. So 
it makes it hard to judge exactly what the distances are. And I think when you have such a zoomed in perspective, a lot of times things look a lot more dramatic than what might have actually taken place. Because even the way that helicopter maneuvers and how close it seems to be to obstacles makes the video appear much more dangerous than it might have been if you were there on the ground and be able to actually see how much distance there is between all these different obstacles and the helicopter and the drone. So it's definitely something to take into consideration that a very strong zoom lens can create a different picture from what actually uh, took place if you would have been able to see it from the ground up, basically. Objects in the mirror appear closer than they are, right? The little line in your side view mirror? Great example. But I got to say, if you are out there using your drone to document protests or to help small business owners against looting, please just follow that formula that we put on the Drone U website because we do truly want to help people. Which brings me to my last point about that particular instance, Haya. Drone pilots, do not forget, you must yield to manned aircraft. Unfortunately, that really sucks when helicopters are doing what they're doing. But maybe this will cause a conversation at the FAA or at the NTSB and say, uh, okay, so um, 14 CFR 91119 section Charlie specifically says a helicopter can fly at any altitude provided that they can land safely. I don't see how helicopters are landing safely in that area. So I would love to see the FAA come out with a clarification and say helicopters 119 section C is still relevant, but if you operate egregiously and recklessly against drone pilots and you can see them in the area, it seems like a contradiction that needs to be addressed or at least clarified. So I would love to see the FAA come out and uh, help the drone community and uh, just just better understand that because don't forget, Haya, LA County, LA County has a history of doing this. We had this happen to us at Newport Beach in 2017, and I had to radio the tower to radio the helicopter that you are harassing drone pilots. I said, we all landed when you showed up and then you just hovered at 40, 50 feet. I called the pilot because I found his information because you old Mm -hmm. cannot hide from us. And I called him and I said, look, dude, hey, we're all trying to fly in the skies safely. Like, what's your intention by trying to egregiously aggravate drone pilots like do you do you think that this is going to help the situation at all and luckily had a great conversation amazing i think he was so surprised to really hear a drone pilot say hey look you expect us to do x and if you expect us to do x we expect you to do y and if you don't then you can't really expect drone pilots to operate safely if you are not being a leader yourself especially as a police helicopter pilot. So um, I know that there's a history of this in LA County and it doesn't matter where it is or who it is. I think what matters, Haya, is that we get some clarification to truly make the skies safer. I was just going to say, uh, what was the other helicopter that we saw last week that was flying over people trying to scatter the, the protesters? I um, cannot find the helicopter because they're saying it's a National Guard helicopter, but then I later yeah. read that it had a red cross on the bottom of it, but it was and not a red cross helicopter. No, it's, uh, I don't think it was a red cross helicopter, but it did have a red cross painted on it. I'm looking it up here. It said it was over Washington streets on Monday nights. Yeah. This is from two weeks ago. In one of the articles I read about that was that that was a technique that they developed during the Vietnam War, where they would use helicopters that would fly really low to disperse people. And that's apparently what they what they were trying to do here as well, which would make it at least a second example of uh, a helicopter being used in a, in a pretty dramatic and potentially dangerous way. I, I would ask every military uh, and National Guard helicopter pilot, I want you to think before you do this to someone else, I want you to imagine that your family is down there in that protesting crowd and you may or may not know it. And what if something were to happen and it affected your family? Should we really be using military tactics at home? Does that help leadership paint the right picture? I don't think so. I don't think so, Haya. Uh, And I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole, but I'm really, I, I think... You know, I've mentioned this before, the book, The Fourth Turning, that it's the playbook for 2020, could not be more accurate for what's happening. Seriously, if you read the book, I think that what happens later on in this fourth turning is already happening right now and it's speeding up. And um, 
I'm not sure it's all a bad thing. I know it's challenging government, but government is typically the last to react to new developing technology. And new developing technology also changes ideology, right? So I would just like to remind everyone that's like protesting is bad. It doesn't do any good. We need to do this the nice way, the right way. Well, I think people were trying for years to do that and it didn't work. So if we remember too, Martin Luther King, there was rioting, looting and protesting for six days before the Civil Rights Act came out. So I think if you actually look at the laws of human behavior, right, humans typically don't enact mass change unless an emergency or something drastic happens. So with that being said, once again, we are all human. No matter who you are and what role you're playing in this protest, please do not forget, we are all human. And remember that some people may be hurting really, really bad, and they're not really able to make some of the best decisions. And as emotional thought leaders, we have to remember that. And we have to remember to constantly be willing to fight for change, but do it every day and do it in a way that builds people up, inspires and motivates, not tears people down, ruins businesses and hurts small business owners. Well said. Well said. I could not agree more. (laughs) Wow. Well, well, I guess that brings us to our good news, which Haya I'm going to call you the clairvoyant wizard. As you accurately predicted, Zipline moving from Africa all the way to the United States to help in drone delivery. Well done, my friend. What's going on? It was about time. It was about time. I mean, these guys, you got to give them credit. Uh, It's a U.S.-based company. They've been operating in Rwanda, Tanzania, and Ghana for years. Mostly Rwanda. They've had over 40,000 successful flights. I believe it's 1.8 million miles flown. They've perfected their drone delivery system, as far as I can tell. Uh, Obviously, I've never been there, unfortunately. I've never been able to see it in practice, but I'm anxious to see it. And now that uh, Zipline has started their operations here in the United States and North Carolina, uh, I might actually be able to go there and check it out. What they've done is that Zipline, when they started, they got approval from the FAA. They're working together with Novant Health and they're flying from one Novant location to the other. So they're doing it within a company structure, which is what is allowed under your part 107, which is what they're using in this case. They brought over drone engineers from Rwanda to help set it up here in the United States and get this drone operation off the ground faster. And as we all know, fixed wing drones, they can cross distances much, much faster than uh, delivery vans or other kind of more traditional courier systems. And they've been using it here in the United States. Now, there's a couple of things you have to keep in mind. They cannot make deliveries to the public. So it has to be within the corporate structure, basically. So they're flying from one corporate location to another corporate location. Also, they're not allowed to fly across state lines, which you may wonder why that is the case, but that's how the law is written, I guess. However, it's good to see that Zipline is... um, able to have this test set up operational and show to people here in the United States how you can use drones. And there are many, many cases in the US where a drone will be able to deliver packages much, much faster than you could do by uh, traditional delivery methods. Now, in a lot of cases, people think, oh, hey, uh, I live in New York. Uh, A drone would be great in New York to deliver a package from A to B. Now, those densely and and highly uh, populated urban areas are, of course, a lot more challenging. There's a lot more at stake. But if you think about, let's say, medical uh, deliveries that are urgent and you're looking at an area where there's not a, a lot of other type of obstruction, let's say around Seattle, where you have a lot of islands and it might not be so easy to get from location A to B, that's exactly where a drone would be hugely beneficial. So I hope that uh, with their operation now live in the United States, that a lot of people are going to see the value that drones can bring and that Zipline or other companies are able to deploy drone delivery systems in other parts of the U.S. as well. So I think, uh, yeah, good news and drones for good in this case. Fantastic. I love hearing this. Love, love, love hearing this. And I know this isn't the only piece of good news that you have for drones, right there, Mr. Harry uh, Eyebrow? I see that eyebrow raising up. There, there's more. There's two more. One is a student in Sao Paulo, Brazil, who's been using two Phantoms, a Phantom 1, if you remember those, and a Phantom 3 to take water samples. 
And basically it has a, uh, a little system where there's a tube hanging off underneath the drone. You fly to where you want in the lake or the river or wherever you're doing your water sampling and you just drop it in, get to water and fly back. And he made a paper on this. Uh, his name is, I'm probably going to butcher this, but Caio Cavalieri, uh, if I say that correctly. Uh, he wrote a paper on how he's been using drones to take water samples. I linked it in the Drone Excel article. So if you're interested in this or you want to use a similar method here in the US, then be sure to check it out. It's interesting for sure. It's uh, maybe not groundbreaking, but it's at least a way to do something more efficiently by using drones to do something that normally would have been done by boat where people would go out and water sample. And now you just fly your drone and you can probably cover a much larger area much faster and therefore uh, less expensive. So a good thing again. Fantastic, Haya. Fantastic. And I know there's one last piece of drone news, which brings us to one of my favorite cities. As I learned so much from Montreal and from that geospatial intelligence course and from our good friend, Mr. On Good Singh. I can't call him Fixed Wing Singh, though, because he doesn't actually fly Fixed Wing. So uh, that, 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 that nomenclature Thanks. is gonzo. So <laughs> sorry, buddy. You have to actually be able to fly them. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, but what takes us to Montreal, my friend? Yeah, um, it's cool because I, I know a few people who work in broadcasting in Canada and they use drones. They have about 30 of them and half of them are DJI Mavic Minis. And Minis in Canada are easier to operate because you don't have to deal with a lot of deregulation. And broadcasting takes place in 1080p. So the video footage from a Mavic Mini is actually good enough. So what happens is a lot of these reporters, in this case, somebody from Radio Canada, they carry these Mavic Minis with them pretty much all over the place, anywhere they go. And that allows you to get some really, really cool footage. What happened uh, last week is that in the St. Lawrence River that runs past Montreal, there was a humpback whale that had swum upstream to a place where normally you would not see humpback whales. And sure enough, this reporter was able to uh, launch his Mavic Mini, fly out over the river and get some uh, some awesome footage of a whale breaking or breaching the water with uh, Montreal in the background. And it's cool because, of course, humpback whale is one of the biggest uh, mammals on planet Earth, and it's being captured with one of the smallest drones that we know and use often. So a cool video. If you're into wildlife or you're into these kind of things, then be sure to check it out. It's on Drone Excel, and yeah, I thought it was worth uh, sharing for sure. I'm curious how they do the live stream out of the Mavic Mini because that remote has and the app has a lot of limitations. So I'd be super curious to see how that happens. But uh, I don't know. Something just rubs me the wrong way when like, do you I mean, like, do, does, do people think about this? Like, OK, you can have a drone sub 250 kilograms and then you don't have to deal with the regulations because you're really not a risk. Right. That is the most flawed, stupid statement I've ever heard because it just goes to show that most governments really have no no idea about how to mm. actually fly and what it takes to be safe because yeah. that drone has no way to stop a flyaway. Because it doesn't have a true attitude mode, aka a sensor denied mm. flight mode, that really makes it not a safe drone. If there's a flyaway or if something happens, there's actually a larger propensity for something to happen to that drone. Is there a real safety risk though? Mm, not really, but wouldn't the government want pilots to have a vehicle that can be truly safe? And yeah, because it's truly safe, it's probably going to weigh more than 250 grams, but it's still not a safety yep. hazard. So maybe this rule on micro drones should just apply to all drones sub two kilograms. Brandon Schulman had a session. This is back in 2017 when, the, when the, we had the convention in Denver. He had one presentation exactly about where the 250 grams comes from and how it's super arbitrary. And it was basically just a number. I think, I think it actually comes from half a pound. So it's not even all that precise, really, because half a pound is not exactly 250 grams. I'll look it up because I think I recorded that session, but he spent 45 minutes talking about how it's arbitrary and how, I mean, they had to come up with a number, I guess. So in that sense, at least we have something to build a framework around. But 
the actual number and why it's specifically that number does not make a lot of sense at all. And uh, what you pointed out, yeah, I mean, the Mavic Mini is is uh, less of a safety hazard because it has less mass and less weight, so it can only do so much damage. But at the same time, if you look at what would make a drone safe, and an Eddy mode is one of the ways to make a drone more safe, then it would be nice if you had that feature standard on any DJI drone, really. And it, uh, it doesn't come standard on the uh, DJI Mavic Mini, which is a shame, really, because it would have made the drone even safer than it already is. I couldn't agree more. And actually, the newer, modern version of Attitude Mode is really not even safe in itself. We need a truly censored-denied Attitude Mode. And uh, I just have to say that, like, like the old Attitude Mode on the, uh, you know, like on the Phantoms and the Mavics, etc. And frankly, it just goes to show, Haya, how can we expect the drone community to listen to our government when they impose laws that actually make drone flying less safe. I mean, I think history goes to show that we uh, humans know empirical evidence is true because it's what we know, it's our reality, right? And if we know our reality is one way, but the government is telling us, no, that's not the reality, well, hold on a minute. Doesn't history say that when we know reality is reality and it's not what you're saying, well, we know that society typically moves in alignment with reality. So I just hope, gosh, uh, December 2020 is going to be one of the biggest months in aviation history. And I think the protest might actually help drone pilots because it's showing what happens when there's not a mass non-compliance. And I don't think that's good for anyone. It's not good for drone pilots commercial. It's not good for hobbyists. And it's not good for AMA. This goes back to what we've been talking about all along, right? I mean, empirical evidence and experience comes from the people that have that experience, right? It comes from the people who actually fly drones for a living, for a hobby, on a daily basis, who know what works and what doesn't work. And that goes right back to the FAA. Look at uh, the people that are part of the DAC committee. I mean, how many drone pilots are on the DAC committee? One? Yeah. Brendan Schulman? No, Brendan's not a pilot. He's a hobby pilot. Um Still, he has years of experience, um, but not that many, not that many, right? Look at the cohort, the companies that were selected to help uh, the FBA put together their uh, technology for remote ID for drones. There are no drone pilots in that team either. So if the government really cared and they wanted to come out with rules that make sense and that work for drone pilots, they would get a lot of support. But we see the opposite. We see people saying, oh, we're not going to comply. We see people actually traveling, taking time out of their schedule, traveling to Washington, D.C. to protest in front of the FEA offices to make this point. And I, I agree with what you were saying earlier, is that if the government really did care, they would listen to people who fly drones for a living on a day-to-day -day basis. And I agree with you 100%. And I think that there is actually a very real security risk with drones, and it has nothing to do with DJI, and it has nothing to do with the internet stuff that we've been talking about. There is another uh, very real security risk. And we do have to address that in one way or another so that hobbyists, recreational people, STEM pilots, and commercial guys can still take flight. So my point in saying this is, right, you know, there's always the argument that in order to have security, we must give up privacy. That is a false paradox. That's like the matrix, the red pill and the blue pill. I think what the matrix was trying to show people is that there's a paradox in just the choice between two. There is no choice between two. There are many other choices. There are creative alternatives. And this is actually an instance where it's not hard to create a creative alternative that gives us security and gives us privacy. Yeah. So And compliance. Yes, yes. And we want compliance, just to be clear. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I, I, I don't think I was very fair with Brendan Schulman. Brendan is a pilot. He's been flying actually longer than I have. I just have a high standard of what pilot means. So forgive me, Brendan. I apologize. <laughs> I just am like, okay, unless you can stall your drone and fly in attitude mode the whole flight and do it smoothly, you're not really a pilot in my eyes. Uh, but that, that's, that level's a little too high, but I think everyone or every pilot should have that knowledge if they want to be truly successful because... Being able to control a drone with no sensor assistance is what really makes a good pilot. And no offense, but if you think you're going to work on set and fly in GPS mode, you are smoking some real good stuff. And on that bombshell, that leaves us with one more story that we can't forget about, which is yeah. Haya 
got some great intelligence from a really, really great place. And now he's taken that intelligence to show us that more drones do really exist in this industry. Hiya, what do you have? Yeah, and one drone that might actually uh, come to market uh, sometime this summer. If you guys remember the Parrot and Avi, the French drone from the drone maker Parrot, very lightweight, almost almost flimsy. I mean, I don't know if you can see this on camera, but the arms and the props are super lightweight. Folds like a not like a Mavic, but it folds, mm -hmm. so it's very easy to take with you. And Right when this drone came out, uh, a lot of people were like, hey, that's a great drone. It's lightweight. It's very quiet. There is ways we can put a drone like that to use. And a lot of these people were coming from, uh, let's say, first responders and search and rescue. Parrot has been working on a drone like this, and they now have a drone that is similar to the Anafi, based on the Anafi, but it's outfitted with a dual camera system that has a thermal camera as well as two other lenses. And it almost functions like a, I think it works almost like, let's say the uh, iPhone 11, where you have a wide angle lens and a zoom lens or a tele lens. And with software, you can zoom from a wide angle perspective all the way to 30 times zoom. And that's combined with a thermal camera. So if you look at uh, our YouTube page, you can see the video of how much you can zoom in with thermal and get some really uh, clear footage, really useful footage, high resolution footage that will be very useful if you're looking for a missing person, let's say in a in a forest or in, in some uh, larger setting. This drone is very different. There's gonna be two versions. One is for the military that will not of course be available to the public. And then there's another one that will be a civilian version that will be used by police departments, fire departments, first responders, search and rescue. And again, you get the benefits uh, of having a folding drone, a very lightweight drone, but then with a very powerful zoom thermal camera. And we know that um, in many cases where we wrote about people being safe with the use of drones, in many of those situations, the thermal camera actually made all the difference because it allows you to find people much, much faster than just with an optical camera. So I'm very excited about this. We're not quite sure what the drone is going to be called. We suspect it's going to be launched this summer, so that shouldn't be too long from now anymore. And I think it's a drone that's going to make a lot of people uh, quite excited. I think it's going to make people really excited. Uh, and I would say that I'm sure public safety would be really excited. But now that there's this, in, this huge push to defund police, I hope that doesn't happen because I think this is such a great tool to protect police and to protect people and to offer transparency if used responsibly. Key point, used responsibly. Yeah, totally agree. Um, we know that a lot of drones, especially the bigger drones, of course, are very expensive. And then training and maintaining those drones, training pilots, I mean, becomes expensive as well. And then if you look at some of the police budgets that were used to start a drone program, you're talking about $80,000 or $100,000. Like that stuff gets expensive quickly. And when you when you mention that uh, police budgets might be under pressure, then that will be an issue. However, we also know from the fire department in New York that the trend has been to move to smaller drones and smaller drones tend to be less expensive as well. So hopefully departments can still launch drone programs with smaller drones like the uh, DJI Mavic 2 Enterprise uh, or the new uh, Parrot and Avi that's gonna hit the market uh, hopefully sometime this summer. Awesome, well, hi, uh, I'm excited for it myself, <laughs> frankly, because I think there's many many commercial uses. But anyway, that's going to do it for our show today. Haya, thank you so much for keeping us in the know and giving us our weekly debrief. Yeah, awesome. My pleasure, Paul. Well, that's going to do it for us today, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. If you want to support the show or support what we're doing, think about becoming a Drone U member and check out our new upcoming podcasts and new upcoming educational programs where we believe once launched well, we won't really have any competition. And I think it's going to be something that's really exciting and a lot of fun. Think of video games. That's going to do it for us today. My name is Paul. He's the Flying Dutchman. This is Ask Drone You. Drone You.